You know, there's a certain amount of irony that I, and pressure I feel right now, telling you about all these awesome things on YouTube, about how to travel and why you should listen to me, and yet again, I didn't plan out today. I got into the Airbnb last night and immediately went to bed. So this morning over my hot bowl of miso soup, which I got from ordering on the dry erase board from the super last night, I'm gonna jump on this local train in downtown Sapporo for $3,000 and only two weeks of prep. Spent three weeks going all around Japan. I'm actually worried about one thing more than anything else. Am I allowed to eat here? I'm running out of time. I can't decide where I'm gonna go. Just wish I had more photos and video because this place is so clear in my mind. <laughs> I'm gonna jump on this local train in downtown Sapporo. Now this small thing is a streetcar, so it's wedged very tightly between two sets of roads and it doesn't go very far, which means I don't have long to figure out where I'm going. I'm looking over some pamphlets that I picked up from some locals and I can't help but be really attracted to this town on the northwest side of the city. Well, it, you know, about 30 minutes away, but regardless, it's called Otaru and it's on the Sea of Japan but I just came to Sapporo. I rented a room here. I'm in the city after nine hours on the train and I just, now I wanna leave it to go someplace else on my first day. Honestly, the more I'm reading this pamphlet, I can't say no to Otaru. It's too cool sounding. Sapporo, the beer museum, all that. That can wait till tomorrow. Today, I clearly need to be in Otaru. As I'm riding the train to Otaru, again, we're gonna see the Sea of Japan the whole way because this train's tracks are like right there on the ocean. The, the beach ends, then there's some rocks and there's tracks. So this view is scenic and serene. And while I'm enjoying it, I'm taken back to when I was about a sophomore in high school because the main reason I wanna to go to Otaru is they're famous for glass working. Now I went to Venice when I was in high school and I got to see the Murano glass factory there. And it's an amazing talent to see somebody blow glass. So I'm really curious, what is it like to see glass blowing in Japan versus glass blowing in Italy? When I roll up in the train to Otaru, this is probably my favorite train station yet. You get off on the train, go up a staircase, and then you go over the top of the train, but the retaining wall off to the right is just covered in this gorgeous vines and trees and branches and it has this very earthy and bright tones to everything. There's this one particular photo I took that I just absolutely love and takes me right back there every single time. Continuing on down the street, I finally find it. A giant storefront that spans almost half a city block and that's the Kataichi Glass Company. This is why I came here. I wanna see what a Japanese take on glass blowing is. Now I mentioned before I'd been to Murano Glass in Venice and they specialize in, well, all the things, particularly like rosaries, upwards of chandeliers, lots of little statues and maquettes. But here at Kataichi, most of this is functional glass. There's lots of soy sauce bottles, miso bowls, an infinite amount of sake sets. It seems like the artists and creators here at Kataichi want you to put the glass front and center every day, not just in a cabinet. And I love that. What I appreciate most about Kitaichi glass for someone who can't afford almost any of it is that the stores are all interconnected, almost alleyway-like. You can flow from one into another, the spaces feel massive and then shrunk, but they all feel museum-like. Now, I'd really like to show you more photos of all these that I took, but there are about a billion signs inside that say that photos aren't allowed. So the already illegal ones you've gotten, you need to be grateful for. I wasn't gonna get kicked out. I needed to stay in here long enough to find something to buy. Finishing up at Kataichi, I picked my things to take home with me that I want and can't afford. Two chopstick rests, one for red, one for blue, because of course, and a poinsettia flower ornament for my Christmas tree. I absolutely adore collecting unique Christmas ornaments, so now every year I'm gonna to get to remember my time here. On the other side of this city block full of amazing glass, there are a bunch of canals that span through this downtown cultural and arts area of the city. Going beyond the canals is the port. Now it's getting late in the day and I'm just excited to see the sunset. And so with the Sea of Japan sprawling out ahead of me, with these merchant and military ships in front of me getting their silhouettes cast back from the gorgeous setting sun and sky colors, I find myself, I'm just gonna sit here until sundown. It doesn't really matter to me about anything else. I've got nowhere to be. 
is a stunning, and I think about my dad. I haven't talked to him at all on this trip. His schedule didn't really allow for us to chat very easily, so I wish I could call him. Something about this moment makes me think of him. Luckily, I have the photos and the video now, but yeah, this was definitely a moment I wish he'd been there to see with me. With the sun going down, it's getting cold, and now it's starting to rain, and of course, I have no plans for dinner. So as I wander around the increasingly dark city of Otaru, trying to find some place to eat, there's this incredible corner of a block that looks like it's straight out of the Edo period. It has the beautiful red lanterns, lots of lights amidst the, like I said, ever-darkening city, so something has to be going on in here. And I weave my way in, and I find this tiny shop, open the door, and it's even tinier inside than I thought. At most, this place sits for people, and there are none in there. All right, this is where I'm eating. And in fact, this restaurant specializes in Xiaolong Bao, which are these little soup-filled dumplings. Now, how do you fill a dumpling with soup? Well, you take frozen materials, all the innards, the pork, the veggies, the anything you want, and you roll it up inside of the dumpling dough, and then you put them in this basket to steam them. So, as you cook the dumplings, the soup inside thaws, heats up, and stays inside of the dumpling. Then you put it in your soup spoon, you lift it up to your mouth, you take a little bit of a bite so it drains into the spoon to catch the soup, and then you down the whole thing. And in many cases, burn the heck out of your mouth. But they're incredibly delicious, and absolutely a thing you must have anytime you see them on the menu. There are a couple truly incredible things about what I've just stepped into. For me, I've been wanting to try a Yatai, and I thought that was only gonna happen in Fukuoka. Blogs implied that was the last place they existed, but this is actually a Yatai. So in this very small, intimate space with this chef, I'm actually worried about one thing more than anything else. Am I allowed to eat here? I don't know. If you're unaware, there's actually, and it is real, though uncommon, an issue inside of Japan or sometimes restaurants say, no gaijin, no foreigners, no people that can't communicate with us. We don't want to deal with them. They can't read the menu. They can't order. They probably won't like the food. And for them, they'll probably consider it expensive and maybe they won't pay. Forget it, no gaijin. But that's not the case here because this guy is just honestly the coolest dude I've met. He is just excited to see anyone come in during the rain. And he turns around to me, a glow and hands me this one page menu, the rest is on the wall, and says, what do you want? And that's about all the English he's gonna speak for the rest of the night, which is what makes him even more incredible. He was willing to have as deep of a conversation as possible with me through the Google Translator app. I haven't met anybody yet who was comfortable doing this. For such a small shop, there are so many little foods and drinks and beers and tastes and textures this guy has on offer, all on his own. But the most excellent thing that he does is his steamed crab dumpling. In fact, it turns out his steamed crab dumpling is the second best in the city. He has a certificate on the wall proving the quality of his food. He has won an award for it. How did I just lock into a random place in the rain that has food this good? Incredibly fortunate. The only sadness that brings me is I just wish I had more photos and video because this place is so clear in my mind. <laughs> It's so, oh man. As much as I'd love to stay here in the rain and the warmth of this restaurant, eating delicious food, I do need to get going. So I do say goodbye to the shop owner and it's immediately obvious that even more of this town is shut down. I, f I feel a bit like that person running down a hallway in a horror movie where the lights are slowly turning off behind them. So I gotta find anything else I can do tonight before this town is completely shut down. As I ascend out of Otaru further into the darkness, I get to a fork in the road. And on the left is the nicely lit path up to the train station, and I'll be back to Sapro. But on the right is Temptation, a kind of dankly lit parking lot with a book off in the back. And I, I haven't gone figure hunting in days. I've been very good to not buy things, but I'm weak right now. Something tells me that this <laughs> almost video game secret area like effect I feel from this book off has something for me. I need to go inside. What's really kind of funny about this book off is it's the biggest one yet, but it's also the least interesting for me. 
It clearly has a lot of used furniture and stuff that I haven't seen elsewhere, almost warehouse-like, but it's also kind of chaos, so I'm not, it's late. I don't have time to go through all this. Where are the figure cases? And then I find them. And in fact, I find an incredibly rare figure that I'd been wanting to buy right before this trip, but it was impossible to find or unobtainably expensive. Now this, this is the figure, all right? My favorite villain and character in all of Dragon Ball Z is Cell, and I find this gnarly looking guy, all right? But what's really special about him is he's a prize figure, all right? So you go to a crane game or something and you get a box and it's gonna have him in it. And, okay, you get to look at him, you know what you're getting. But in a rare occasion, you might have a similarly shaped box that doesn't have him, a chase variant. And so you actually detach Cell from this. Now this is a tail swap for him for when Android 18 got absorbed in making semi-perfect Cell into perfect Cell. <laughs> And that is one of the coolest story moments for the villain. And now I get to put them together and have this like canon story moment vignette captured as a figure. And I've always wanted it. And I've, I get to find it myself. It's new in box and just, <laughs> I can't wait to get home. No one's going to believe I found this. There's a very interesting catharsis that I feel making this episode and telling you about Otaru. I've tried to talk about this trip to so many people and many have asked me questions. But as you've seen through all these episodes, it's a long trip, there's a lot of content. So a lot of people just aren't around long enough for me to get past Ikitsuki. Who knows about Akita? Who knows about Otaru and Sapporo? These are stories and moments I have barely been able to share with anyone just by merit of there being so much to say. Now, getting to make these videos, these episodes here, I feel a relief. I feel like I'm finally able to share what I've been longing to share for seven years. Tomorrow, it's the Beer Museum and Miku's house. Of all the incredible places I went in Japan, no place like Otaru has that compulsion where I want to have everyone there with me. I want to show them how magical and incredible Japan can feel. And Otaru embodies that more than anywhere else I went.